All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we are reviewing sprints 48 and 49. Just a few intro slides, um, not um, any major changes here. Um, you can see the, the teams and their current focus. Um, on the initial slides here. Um, focuses haven't really changed. <clears throat> yep. There we go. Too long for one slide. No, we got so many teams. Okay, so core team developers, no changes. Um, I think we do have some new folks uh, a little further down. <clears throat> Somewhere here, we had some new developers. Just scanning for the new indicator. Yes, okay, here we go. FollyJet has two new developers, um, Nick and Sasha. And then on Spitfire, we've also got two new developers, uh, Igor, um, Ivan, and Victoria is the new Scrum Master. Um, she's Scrum Master also for uh, Thunderjet. And then I think there were also some new developers on Vega. Okay, one new developer on Vega, Anton. So welcome to all the new team members. We're glad to have you guys. Um, okay, so um, just uh, a little update on the Q4 release. Um, we are now into the Q4 development period. We started on October 1st and the uh, release date is January 14th. Um, per direction from the Product Council, our focus um, right now is on delivering features needed by our first early implementer, uh, Chalmers. Um, the reason why this was priori prioritized, um, or one of the reasons why this was prioritized, is um, because Chalmers needs um, are sort of a subset, represent a subset of, of the needs of um, the sort of larger early implementer group. Um, so it was uh, the perfect sort of place to focus our efforts. Um, plus it benefits us all to have a customer live on Folio. So that's our, our focus um, for Q4. Um, you can see uh, there's a new weekly status report um, that you can see on the wiki here. I'll jump over. Uh, that has some high level updates on sort of project planning, platform developments, um, some statistics, so you know, how many functional features do we have targeted um, for Q4 as of today? How many NFRs do we have targeted as of today? Um, this is where you see the overall status update and Jakob usually adds a platform update here as well. I think that's coming soon for this week. Um, the product owners will put some specific updates over here in the product owner updates table. You can see the history for both the overall status update um, by clicking this link and um, the product owner updates as well, um, clicking this link. Got some statistics here. And then links off to some dashboards and things in JIRA. So I might have showed this last week, but I thought I would pull it up again, uh, last month, I mean. Um, so that is the status report. And also linked from that status report is um, the, the new release milestones document. So you can find that link on the status report, but I've also linked to it here. So I'll pull that up and I'm going to let Jakob speak to this. Um, Jakob, do you want to give a little sort of overview of the release milestones for Q4? Sure. Um, let me just, do you want to keep on sharing your screen? You can take over if you'd prefer. Um, I think that's probably okay. Just, just scroll to the top. The top. Uh, okay. So, uh, in a nutshell, um, we've identified a series of uh, milestones for the quarter of four release. Uh, this is primarily based on the Q3 release calendar, with some things being sort of moved around just to accommodate a couple of uh, um, um, requests we uh, uh, we've seen from uh, from team members and external teams. So specifically. Uh, the way this is uh, laid out on a on a timeline is to enable um, a dependency management, uh, easy dependency management for 
uh, for the for the for the release uh, for the uh, for the final release. So in Q3, uh, we struggled with things uh, not being released on time. So especially the dependencies not being released on time, so that uh, uh, the front enders uh, can proceed with uh, with uh, releases of uh, of uh, UI modules, and finally uh, the DevOps team can proceed with a release of a uh, of a final build, uh, which starts with a platform. Uh, so this has sort of a avalanche effect. So uh, in this timeline, we make sure to accommodate this. And as you can see, the first uh, um, bolt, um, uh, the first entry in bolt is the um, uh, November 30. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going from the, <laughs> yeah, from okay, the, from the November, <laughs> November 30 um, uh, date. That's the date. Uh, uh, that is the, the final uh, date uh, deadline for releasing both the backend modules and the, uh, the front end the dependencies, the, the shared libraries. Uh, so effectively the Stripes framework. Uh, with those released, uh, uh, a week after we'll, uh, we'll expect the external backend and UA modules to be released. Uh, so those will be obviously ready, but the final re the prior to that uh, in terms of their features, but the, the, the final release uh, is planned for the, from the 7th of, the, of December. And finally, uh, the 14th of December, um, uh, the core UI modules will be released. So the core UI modules are usually the things that sit on top of the dependency chain. Uh, and with things being released, especially the backend and uh, um, dependencies and the shared uh, Stripe dependencies being released uh, prior to that, we should be in a position to meet this deadline. So that's that's in a nutshell. There is some other um, there are some other milestones here that are um, uh, relevant for the POs and uh, uh, translators uh, and uh, uh, and DevOps. Uh, and our testers as well. Um, what's also being taken into account is this timeline is of course the, uh, the holiday break, uh, uh, which will probably be different for different uh, team members, but uh, we're expecting some downtime uh, during the, 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 the holiday week. And uh, that final sprint, uh, sprint 50, <clears throat> for if I'm not mistaken, uh, will be a three week sprint. Uh, and that's going to be the hardening sprint within uh, during which we will uh, focus on testing the release and bug fixing. So we'll uh, leave a bit more time compared to the previous release for releasing bug fix releases. Um, and I think that's it in the nutshell. I should also say that uh, uh, this timeline is uh, a bit more relaxed compared to the, uh, the timeline for the Q3 release. I think uh, if we take away the, the holiday week, we're actually, uh, we have designated one more week, one additional uh, week uh, for this release. Um, so it should be fairly relaxed, uh, especially that a lot of uh, procedures uh, have been verified with Q3, so, uh, uh, so we'll be, uh, we should be in the, um, in a better position to follow them for the, for the Q4 release. And I think we've tested also the process quite extensively in Q3. Um, plus we have the additional week, so, uh, so it, should be, it should be much more relaxed. And I think By that's relaxed, what I have. You mean relaxed for the, oh, uh, the yes. release? Sorry, the, the release I should work? be more clear. Yeah, uh, meaning uh, for uh, people involved in making particular releases of the modules. I see. Would be the front enders and the back enders, but also uh, the DevOps guys that should have uh, uh, should have more time to uh, to finalize the uh, the release and set up the uh, spin up the uh, the environments. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And so, just to be clear, like where it says um, Stripe's framework is released, base uh, backend modules are released. These are essentially the feature freeze dates for backend modules and Stripe's framework. Yes, you, you okay. could, yeah, you could, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's probably how it should be called, yes. But it's okay like this as long as people know. Um, yeah, and I think part of also why it's a little more relaxed, I guess, for the actual release um, creation is that we've, we've, yeah, we've put feature freeze for, um, at least for the backend modules, I think is a week earlier than it was last time. So that Correct. gives us a bit of extra time as well. Okay, any questions on this? All right, cool, thanks Jakob. Thank you, Kate.
okay. Um, definition of done. This is just sort of a reminder. Nothing has changed here um, for this sprint review. We're still in general um, showing um, only uh, stories and bugs that have passed QA. Um, we will be adding some new, I think before the next sprint review, there'll probably be some additional um, sort of de definition of done criteria being added, but uh, this is just um, a carryover from last. Um, and then we have um, the sprint highlights. So the product owners from all of the various teams have um, entered the um, highlights. So what they've been working on um, for the past couple of sprints. Not gonna go through these in detail um, because we will be demoing much of this. If there's time at the end, um, maybe the POs can speak to some of the work that's been happening. Um, last time we actually had some extra time. So we'll see if that happens again. So these are the highlights. And that brings us to, wow, a lot of teams now. Okay, so that brings us to the demos. Um, okay, so um, we have FollyJet up first with Victor and Alexi. Are you guys on? Uh, yep, uh, it's Victor, uh, I'm going to, I'm ready actually, yeah. Okay, I'll stop I... sharing. Yes, you can go for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you please confirm whether you see my screen? <clears throat> I do see your screen. Great. So uh, today uh, I'm going to uh, share some progress which we have on uh, UI data import application I'm sharing from uh, Folia testing <clears throat> snapshot uh, and uh, in scope of uh, uh, this feature yeah, the progress which we have uh, so far during this spring demo is uh, we created uh, the new application uh, for this stuff and uh, uh, set up um, some uh, UI uh, logic yes uh, UI components for the feature, yes, this is like the basement for the future development. But uh, uh, as you can see now, we have, um, according to requirements, three panes. Yeah, we're going to have jobs, works, and import. And uh, this is how import uh, uh, will end up looking like uh, without interaction yet. But uh, this is just uh, UI, as I said. And uh, uh, yes, the last feature, the last thing here is we are going to drag and drop here files and I'll choose it uh, manually. And uh, about jobs tab, uh, this is uh, how a job items, individual jobs, uh, job items are going to look like. Uh, here you can see three states. Um, for uh, preview is ready component, for preview is preparing, for uh, preparing yeah, in progress, and uh, when the, the individual job is running. And uh, this is pretty much all for now. Any questions? Can I also just mention, um, this is Anne-Marie, I'm PO for data import. The, the third pane, the drag and drop area, um, this is the start of a component that's gonna be used for file uploading. And we are building it as part of data import to start with. But we met with um, Kalila and Stephanie. Um, th there's definite need for this across all of Folio. Um, for us, this will be importing files that we're then going to do stuff with as far as um, creating or updating records in, in inventory and acquisitions. For other areas, it may just be a matter of um, uploading a file that you want to attach uh, an, uh, to an agreement or to a user or uh, uh, a vendor. So uh, 
uh, Stephanie already had done a lot of UI work on how the file upload should look. And so we've taken um, that work plus input from Philip, and we are going to build this as part of data import to start with. And then the intention is once that infrastructure is there and we're building it very flexibly, that then um, it can get turned into a, a more general Stripes component that would be applicable across the rest of Folio as well. So kind of trying to take care of two things at once. Cool. And when you talk about the general Stripes component, Anne-Marie, are you talking about um, drag and drop to import files or just drag and drop in general? So file upload, which would be drag and drop to import files or to do the choose files. And um, so we're going to build it the way we need it for, for data import, but we're, we're making it flexible as far as what the wording is going to be, how big the box can be, um, where you land after you let go of the mouse or after you hit select for the choose files. And then Stripes Force will take it and kind of refactor it into a more general component. Cool. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks, and Maria Via for clarifying things. Thanks, Victor. Thank you. Is Alexi going to demo as well? Or was that it for your team? Yes, hello. Oh. Hi. Uh, can you share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, do you see it? Yes, I do. Uh, okay, hello all. I am a backend developer of FolioJet team, and uh, now I mostly busy with um, upload functionality for a data import module. And uh, now I want to uh, share uh, our vision and um, design of uh, upload uh, functionality uh, from backend side and uh, I want to describe and show uh, to community some um, uh, schemas of it and uh, first of all uh, I want to start from uh, the API what uh, mod data import uh, will provide for uh, download upload file to backend and um, for supporting multiple file downloads, uh, we decide to uh, provide uh, two core entities for upload. It's name uh, upload definition and uh, just a file entity. So first of all, uh, if you want to upload file you uh, and you drag and drop it on uh, UI area, you uh, just need to create a upload definition and post it to backend. So there uh, we can see a, a sequence diagram of this functionality and uh, for create upload definition and uh, import jobs we just uh, create a request to backend and say it uh, okay we have uh, three files and we want to upload it to our module uh, after it uh, our backend uh, is create this definition for these files and return to ui um, UIDs for creating uh, uploading jobs for each file and uh, after it um, uh, we can uh, upload one by one our files to uh, backend and also this mechanism provide um, uh, showing a progress bar for um, loading files and uh, why we need this structure of upload uh, definition and uh, the file definition because uh, uh, we can uh, in future uh, after loading of files we can add uh, will add file or delete a loaded file and after this we can say okay we are ready to process um, our job with uh, this list of files uh, and um, there are uh, no uh, UI visualization for it, but uh, it's on progress. And uh, backend for this functionality uh, of upload files to in data import module is uh, also in progress. And uh, I think we will be ready to show it uh, next uh, time. So that's all from my side. If you have some technical questions, you uh, can ask me in Slack or now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions?
All right, great. Well, thanks for your updates, guys. Um, next up is um, at Cult uh, with Marquette updates, um, Tiziana and Christian. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, I'm alone. I try to share my screen if Christian can help me after if uh, we need. Um, yes. Okay, do you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I would like to show you the first development of um, uh, the search uh, module of Marcat. Uh, uh, it has not yet passed the test, but uh, we would like to show the new development because uh, it has been a while and because uh, it's the first release uh, uh, that is uh, really in according with uh, what the Mar uh, Marcat uh, group uh, defined with uh, Philip and David. So uh, we started uh, um, and we finalized this first release. So now we have uh, uh, the ability to search and to apply filters uh, in the database. So we can select uh, uh, an index and uh, we are with the group in discussion about uh, what kind of uh, indexes show as a first and uh, what kind of filter uh, of indexes show as uh, additional and uh, I can put something here and uh, select the condition so the query condition in this case uh, for example start with and uh, I can select uh, and choose uh, for uh, search in a bibliographic uh, database uh, or in authority database or uh, in both. Uh, so in this case, I can select, uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, bibliographic. And uh, uh, I can apply additional filter as uh, uh, shown here. But now I try to search and uh, in the second section of the screen, we presented the result and uh, uh, we will add also an order criteria so that uh, each uh, column can be used to reorder the result. In this case, the blue color show that uh, we have bibliographic record, while the red uh, will show for authority record. And when I click here, uh, I have finally the detail of the record. And starting from this, I can click on edit and start the cataloging uh, workflow to edit a record and so on or I can try to uh, filter this type of query, for example, adding the Spanish as languages and click again. And so a new result summary is presented in the, in the second section of the screen. Or I can show you another type of searching, for example, for a name and a search. We need to add something to, to clean the previous uh, search. Uh, rolling as an author, start with, and in this case, I select for bibliographic and authority records. And in this case, I have here uh, the authority record in red and all the bibliographic record in blue. And if I click here, I have in, this, in the third section of UE the authority record and uh, uh, all the bibliographic records that, are, that use this heading as authority. So again, I can start open this or I can start with a new edit of the file of the record. Um, so uh, right now we need, uh, we are discussing uh, the browse function with the, the group and we need uh, 
uh, refine a bit uh, the user interface for the search. Uh, we need, we are adding something like uh, clear the, the, um, the query uh, criteria and uh, we are working on uh, the additional function that is uh, the cataloging. So I think it could be enough if you have some, any question. I'll just say I'm delighted to see Mark Cat starting to come to life. So it'll be great when we can start seeing it in, um, in testing and snapshot and snapshot stable too. Yes, in fact, now uh, we just, um, I think within this week, we can, uh, we can put available for all people uh, the version so that uh, you can start testing and so we can close at the end of the, the test this first uh, section, this first step of the project. Tijana, maybe you try and... Um and uh, minimize the screen a little bit because uh, what we see here is um, uh, the, the rows are a little not that uh, elegant looking as it was yesterday. Uh, so if you zoom out a little yeah. bit, then uh, people can see here how great it's looking. Yeah, in fact, as we told yesterday, this is just the first release, but we need probably um, uh, harmonize the, the sections and make possible, for example, that we can enlarge or reduce something. So I think that is exactly it's, what... Yeah, It's just the screen size. I think if you... Uh, minimize it a little bit then uh, people can see because it it was looking um, um can you do like control yesterday. control minus on your keyboard yes, yes. Do anything if that's possible yeah yeah yes uh, but, but now uh, you are you are referring now to something yes, that I, now. Right. Yes, yeah now, now. Uh, just, uh, just try a control minus and see if see if that shrinks the font a little bit uh, I don't know. Uh, mm. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I don't know now because he's a, a, he's the first uh, the the mm, my first test here, so I'm not so able to do nothing in addition to okay. this. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm don't sorry. Worry. No worries. We can imagine. It looks great, Tiziana. This looks really good. It's so nice to see this. And one thing that's a little bit related, I think, I think you can kind of see it on her screen. Um, uh, one thing that that uh, Philip brings up a lot is is that the center pane of search results and um, the challenges when you end up with a lot of columns and the horizontal scroll mm. that sometimes shows up. So there's been some discussions in the last couple of weeks about if you were able to resize these panes um, to get rid of the horizontal scroll, being able to go from this kind of table column row and column format to more of a card type format as the center pane gets smaller yeah. or as you get more data in uh, more columns in the center pane. So that's something that um, we're looking at a lot right now and uh, something again that data import's gonna need. So, so we've been doing some analysis to try to figure out um, what it would take to make this uh, table format a more responsive design yeah. and we'll be talking about that with with Philip and with Kalila for Stripes Wars. Yeah yes in fact also the, the the ability to choose some columns or not that we can define uh, in the configuration model so that uh, each library can decide what what type of information are important to show as a search result. So I think that uh, are all uh, tricks and uh, ways to make uh, the user interface more uh, user friendly and uh, useful in any case. Yes, exactly. And we've kind of had this center pane search result for a while. So it's, yeah. it's time to be circling back and making it better. Yeah. Yes, because uh, in right now, 
our first goal was uh, to be sure that the requirements, generally speaking, uh, fit with uh, the 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 long list of requirements that that the group has expressed right correctly of course so now we can work on this addition and improvement so that the also the user interface can become more useful and uh, user friendly yes great that's a great start thank you for sharing okay thank you to you um, okay, so uh, core team is up next with Aditya to start out. Thanks, Kate. Um, sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of stories to demo here. Um, the first one is to do with the request app. Uh, it's about linking the request, uh, linking the request record to the request queue. So the purpose of this story is primarily to enable the users to access an item's request queue from their request record. So for example, let's select uh, the girl on the train here. As you can see, it has two requests against it. Um, one over here and one over here. And so we are, we've added this new field here called position in queue that uh, represents the number of requests open against that uh, item. And once you click on this link here, view requests in queue, takes you to the request app, just basically pre-filtered by the barcode and the two statuses here, open awaiting pickup and open not yet fill. And similarly, we've added this here as well under the item info. The request on item here represents the number of requests and you click on that takes you to the same screen and on the edit pane as well. So the position in queue and view requests and the request on item. Um, and that's with the first one. Second story is regarding moving the service point to location relationship to the locations record. Uh, so previously we had the ability to add locations to a service point record, but since every location requires at least one service point, it made sense to move that logic to the location record than the service point. So previously on the service points, new pane, we had the add location functionality, but that's now been moved to locations wherein we get to add the service point. Um, and as you can see here, this is the new uh, functionality where you have the service point, which is a required field. And every lo uh, location also requires one primary service point associated with it. So the radio button here um, basically represents the primary service point. And the list of, so you have this drop down here with the default being the select service point and the list of service points listed here. So this list is nothing but um, what you have here. And uh, when you select one of these, so there's a bunch of edge cases that we handle here. Uh, you need to have at least one service point. So when you delete all of them, you get this error message and the form won't go through until you select one. And also when you select a bunch of service points and you delete, and you, for example, you delete the primary one, the last existing one would by default become the primary service point. And also to prevent the user from selecting the same service point multiple times, we omit the option that's been previously selected. So this dropdown doesn't have served as one. So you similarly see you won't have the ones that are already selected. And ultimately, if you run out of options, we disable the add service button altogether so that you don't get to just leave empty service points fields open. And so for example, let's create a location. So when you go to locations, see this. 
you have this list here that displays the list of service points and represents which one is selected as primary. And you can edit it. So for example, you change it. So this two becomes the primary one. Um, I think that's it for me. If you have any questions, let me know. Looks good, Aditya. I've been playing around with it. It works really well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just a second. Okay, next up from the core team is Michal. Um, hi, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, can you can you see my screen here? Yes, we can. Uh, Right, so I also have just a couple, couple items here to show you uh, today. The, the first one will be this uh, new ability to, sh to uh, print hold slips at, uh, at check-in. Um, so as you can see, I, I already have, a, have an item here which was previously checked out by a different uh, patron. Um, and we, are, we also have a uh, hold request here, here which is open and not yet filled. So let me just maybe click the um, grab this uh, barcode and go to the check-in. Uh, and now when I try to check in that item, it takes a little while here, but hopefully uh, you can see this new um, dialogue here, which shows us some information about the um, about the, the given item and also this new um, print slip. Uh, Checkbox, which would allow us allow us to to uh, print the print slip for this given uh, this given item. So if I hit confirm here, um, since I'm not running this in the kiosk mode, I am presented with uh, with this typical uh, Chrome um, dialog printing di dialog, and you can see. Let me see if I can zoom this in. And this is the um, the slip for that particular um, item and request, which which was uh, next in the queue, in the re request queue from the previous screen. Um, okay, let me just cancel that. So that's that's it for uh, printing hold slips. Um, another another thing here, which, which we worked on, um, is also related to locations. You probably noticed this from a DTS screen, but we now have this, this ability to um, filter by different um, uh, items, different things here in order to get to, to the specific list of locations. So we are able to search by institution, campus, and uh, library. And then the list here at the bottom is, is just the list related to, to the items uh, we filtered by. Um, so that's, that's the new addition here. Uh, another little thing we added recently is this ability to duplicate a given uh, location. So you can see that we have now this uh, option here to duplicate. If I hit that, I'm presented with the uh, pre-populated form with the uh, pr previous location I choose uh, from. And this is just a nice way to kind of um, create a new location based on the previous location. Uh, you can see that we, we have all those um, all, all this data from the previous location already pre presented here. So um, yeah, that, that should be a little bit easier to create new locations now. And uh, I think that's it from me. So I'm not sure if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Michal. Looks really good. And just to remind everyone, the um, that hold slip that Michal showed is, is um, custom created. So that's um, fully tenant defined in settings, the format and the data that, that's shown there. So we're starting to see that whole um, staff slips feature uh, come to life end to end, which is really nice. Um, okay, so Nils Eric is last from the core team. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you what we've been uh, working on in uh, inventory, uh, uh, as usual. Uh, we've been uh, working on, uh, uh, for one thing, uh, reorganizing the, uh, uh, the instance and uh, holdings pages, both the, the detailed view and the, the edit forms, uh, by um, 
uh, extending the number of uh, uh, accordions that you see here and by rearranging the, the various fields within those uh, accordions. Um, and this is the, the holdings record uh, with uh, one, two, three, four, seven uh, accordions. We had a few before, uh, three, I think. Um, and this is the, uh, the instance uh, record. And then uh, saying that we have the added a, a whole lot of uh, new uh, elements to, to these uh, accordions. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we're not done adding elements, there, there are, are more to come. But, but already now the, the, these uh, pages are, are uh, pretty long. Um, I guess it, it, we have added so many uh, uh, items to these pages that doesn't really uh, make sense to go in and, and explain what each of them are about. And I'm probably not even the best uh, to, to do that. But, uh, but, but uh, we can quickly run through this exam so you get an idea of, of what we've been, been doing. Uh, this, uh, this example is from uh, uh, Felix Hemme of uh, the National Library of uh, Economics, uh, the German National Library of Economics. Uh, he has provided that uh, and it, it, uh, because it has uh, some, uh, some of the, the new uh, data uh, that, uh, that uh, we have been adding to, to the back end and now displaying in the front end. Um, and uh, you have to forgive me if I don't recall exactly which one you've already seen, but uh, but I believe, for instance, all these uh, uh, booleans uh, on off uh, items in top are new. Uh, we now have the human readable ID that uh, that you can set. Catalog date is new, I think. Uh, the the instance status term is a new, and mode of issuance is new. Uh, then we have added uh, index title, which is. Uh, supposed to be used for for sorting and uh, yeah for sorting uh, uh, where where the uh, resource title itself is uh, is not uh, uh, appropriate for it because for instance because it has uh, uh, insignificant words in in the beginning etc etc the series statements were already there identifiers were already there they've been moved to new accordions uh, contributors was already there Edition uh, descriptive data has been extended with the uh, uh, with I think with publication frequency and publication range, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and then we have this uh, this element of the electronic access, uh, and this is uh, uh, these are live examples from uh, uh, from Felix Hamer uh, with uh, uh, with a. Uh, uh, URL and with the uh, link text uh, and uh, 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 type uh, describing the relationship to the resources uh, to this from this instance to the uh, result that is uh, linked to subject classifications and instance relationships we already uh, talked about before and uh, it's uh, pretty much the same thing uh, for for the Hogan's record that one was very small uh, last time. Uh, so uh, that has uh, grown considerably as well. Um, again, we have uh, here the opportunity to suppress it from uh, discovery. It also has a human readable ID. Uh, you can uh, add uh, one or more uh, former IDs if you want to be able to track it back to the system that it originated from. Uh, I think sharing order, sharing title, copy number, call number type, call number prefix, and call number suffix are all new. Uh, the only uh, one we already knew, of course, was uh, call number. Uh, number of items, I believe that's new. We already had holding statements. Uh, we're going to change that so that you can add a note to it. Uh, that's a, 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 what we call a brain change. So it's uh, something that we sort of uh, put on hold and I find a good time to make those brain changes so that we can uh, update all uh, uh, dependent uh, modules back and then front end uh, when we do these brain changes. So that's something we do with care. But, but all the other uh, new holding statements are uh, uh, just additions. Uh, uh, non-mandatory addition so they, they're not breaking so they're here now uh, and, and you can add uh, as many of 
uh, these Hogan statements for supplements or for indexes as, uh, as you want. Then we have a new note section uh, with the format, the acquisition format and method and the uh, receipt datos. Uh, and then uh, the ability to uh, add uh, any number of uh, notes that you want, uh, give, each, give each one a, a certain type. Uh, so there are these uh, types to uh, choose from and uh, and then you can enter the node and you can say if it should be uh, only be readable by by staff and then again on on the uh, holdings level you have uh, the electronic access uh, uh, settings so uh, so they can in other words uh, exist on both the instance and and holding level and uh, as you can see, there is an empty um, uh, according down here, and that's uh, and, and, and as well as here. That's uh, that's the uh, work in progress. We have receiving history in back end. We need to uh, uh, update it here in the front end, and then we have the acquisitions uh, according where there will be uh, coordination with the orders module. Uh, we will probably be mashing up. Uh, data from uh, inventory and orders uh, in this uh, accordion. Anyway, it will uh, display data that somehow comes from, from an order as well as uh, data in, in inventory. So we need to uh, uh, make, that, make that linkage uh, work. So um, we will uh, see more elements uh, to it, but this is uh, how far we got with uh, filling up all our new accordions in inventory for, for these two uh, entity types so far. And then we will continue with item, which will also be uh, much longer. So that was it for me. Thank you. It's really good to see all of this coming to life, Niels Eric. Um, and to see all of this other work that I know has been in process for so long. Um, there's a couple pieces that that uh, touch on data import, which of course is my pet project, um, that are going to be happening in the next few weeks. One is that the the mark data for for instances that have mark underneath them is going to be moved out of inventory where it's stored right now into a new area called source record storage, and that's going to uh, help us when we start adding mark holdings and mark authorities to have all the mark data in one place that's outside of inventory that all the various apps that need to access it can access it from. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Alphonse and Wayne had done a lot of work on the kind of standard mark map for uh, if there's a mark bibliographic record how does that data show as an instance in Folio? And so we're going to take that standard map um, as part of data import um, as kind of the basis for our mapping work and, and hopefully only have to map around the edges of that for the things that need to be different, like the 9xx fields, um, but make sure that that standard mark map has a home um, to, uh, to make, uh, to help with surfacing the um, mark bibliographic records as instances in, in inventory. Well, that's uh, good to know. I think uh, both those uh, lines of development have uh, 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 not have a, a little impact on uh, inventory itself. But, uh, but sure, it, it's good to to know uh, and and uh, and inventory of course have to pick up the uh, uh, the mark uh, uh, the mark source record from from uh, another place than it, it does right now uh, yes and, yeah. and certainly that we will get to that no problem it looks really nice it's actually a ton of progress since I've seen it last and it looks so much better. Just the layout, it's just, it's nice. Um, all right, if there aren't any other questions, then we can move on to the next demo, um, which is um, Carol from EBSCO, next on the list.
Okay. Um, just getting my screen here. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so I am going to be demoing some work that we've done since the last search to enhance search capabilities is available from the codex search, um, specifically for the knowledge base source. Um, so this is actually the ticket that I worked on. Um, and specifically, we're adding support that's available in the Holdings IQ API for advanced search. Um, so there's phrase support, Boolean support, and wildcard uh, character support, as well as nested search. So if we go over to the Codex Search app, um, I can perform, um, I'm going to start with the Boolean search as an example. So I can go in here and search for, say, journals and or magazines. And I'll get results containing journals or magazines within um, the title. Um, I can also do a search for um, journals and magazines. So again, they both need to be there, specifically journals and magazines in the title. Um, and then I could also do a search for journals and not magazines. So again, so we could kind of limit titles in that manner. Um, the second type of search support that's available is phrase or quoted search. So currently, um, there is a limitation. Um, what would what we'd like to be able to do is search for great something like Great Gatsby as quoted, and this would be like an exact phrase search with the terms in the specific order. Um, we did run into some issues when we were testing with the UI in terms of the quotes being preserved um, when they do get passed on to the Mod Codex EKB module. So at this point, this functionality is is not functioning properly, but it's available from the back end. And um, so if we were to support, if the quoting were corrected, we would be able to support that. But as a, as a workaround, we could search for Great and Gatsby to get, oops, help if I spell right. <laughs> also help if I spell right here. Um, so getting terms that contain both Great and Gaps, Gatsby. Um, the next type of search that is a wildcard search, wherein that we can append an asterisk to the end of the search term. So for example, here we can search for um, um, compute and engineering. So we'll get terms like computer, um, computational. So it's it's um, a wildcard type search. Um, and the last type of search is for supporting nested operators. So in here, we for example, we would. Um, add parentheses around terms and combine the Boolean operators and the wildcarding. So if we wanted to search for company or business and report, um, we could limit our results in that manner. Um, so by default, we found that the, the UI currently appends an asterisk to the end of the search terms when they are returned and passed on to the Codex, Mod Codex EKB module. And, and that's something that may not be the exact behavior that we would want from the knowledge base itself. So I had opened um, a, a JIRA ticket to um, hopefully discuss that. Um, so that's 
it for me. I don't know if there's any questions or. This is really cool, Carol. I, um, I'm pretty sure that the local, uh, you can't search with this kind of advanced search syntax, um, the local resources. So what would happen if you tried, like if you checked local there? I could take a look. Does it just apply the, um, the advanced search to the KB results maybe? It will still search the local. So if um, it will just depend on what you, um, let's see. It's just still searching. Let me try one of the Boolean ones. Hold on here. Just plain old journal or magazines. It probably just looks for that as a string in the local results. And maybe it's yeah, just not can... finding anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm not getting any from there. Well, I know there's been a longstanding sort of request to have advanced search capabilities, um, you know, on local resources as well. So maybe this is just kind of the start, something we need to extend to apply is to local inventory. Is that something that we should be addressing, Kate? Um, I we had fewer we stores uh, for this, but um, yeah. How well, do you, Carol? How do you how do you pass that uh, that expression back to the uh, to the KB? Is it passed as sure. a term? It's passed as a term in CQL. So here's the okay. the the. Um, so this is you know, and like an example when we had spring okay. or summer, so it would come in as title in the CQL. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so the way to do it, if we wanted to have that support across local and KB would be to map it to the CQL and expose some uh, advanced search uh, query directly in that search box. Because I don't think we've uh, talked about exposing that advanced search functionality in, in this particular box, right? I know there's been a you know discussion of of wanting this kind of feature, but I'm not sure if it was planned to be in this box or something else. Charlotte may know better. Yeah. Philip has uh, had some different ideas, and uh, this is a little bit different from how it's envisioned uh, done in the market. Uh, yeah. But I, I... I'd say for for because I know that uh, the possibility to search on Boolean uh, use that. Uh, Boolean operators is uh, one of uh, Chalmers' um, requirements, and this would work. Uh, this, I, I'd say, could if, if this is something uh, not difficult to implement in inventory, then uh, that definitely could work until we have one of the solutions Philip has envisioned for. Uh, when you say term. when you say this, Charlotte, you mean exposing the the boolean query directly in this in this input box? Yes, if, if okay. it works in Codex, it could also work in inventory for Q1. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we probably need to regroup and 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 think about how we want that support to work because uh, this as this is done for uh, for the KB, uh, this would have to be changed. This would have to be modified uh, to be able to, to support that across the local and KB. Because whatever you put in that box is a transparent term to the, to the system that is being passed on. So uh, to give you an example, you know, the existing system, when, he, when, when, when the system sees, say, query journals or magazines, that's what it considers. It considers that as a verbatim term. So we, this effectively changes that behavior. And I don't think we, uh, we would just change it for inventory like that. We would, we would need to expand what this box is meant to do. So from the, from the user side, whenever I see a search and filter on this left side, it, it seems to me like I would want them to behave the same way when I have a, exactly. a search box like exactly. this. So whatever we end up doing, it would be really nice to know that 
um, whether it's this or some other standard way of doing it, that, that when I see a box like this, wherever I am in Folio, I know if I put in a capital OR or a capital AND or parentheses, that it's going to work the same way. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right, Marie. And I think this opens a whole can of worms because, you know, I would also expect the filters to be aligned with whatever I put in my, in my advanced search, which, which it, well, it isn't the case right now for this example, right? So I, I think we would have to rethink how this is done. I mean, this approach here obviously makes it work with the KB by just passing it uh, down as a term. Uh, this is not the kind of support we, we can address for the local. We would have to have real support for it. It's definitely a good way of moving the conversation forward, though. And especially mm -hmm. if Chalmers yeah. needs some sort of Boolean. Well, I frankly find this feature really problematic because it changes the existing behavior. Actually, uh Sorry, hopefully you guys can hear me. The reason we implemented this is because we did implement this on the KB for titles, for our title search. And we wanted the search results to be the same as what you got if you were in the eHoldings app conducting a, a title search, and if you were in Codex doing a title search too. I guess I'm, I'm not sure why this is problematic. Um, what we, we've done is pretty standard as far as how we handle, you know, with regard to Boolean operators and how to handle nested searching. How about I, uh, I follow up with you, Kalala, uh, so I can explain exactly why, why this is problematic. Because we probably don't want to hijack this call. I think that sounds good. All right. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Thank you, Carol. Okay. No, my only thought is I want it everywhere. So <laughs> I agree, Anne Marie. I think it's very cool. Um, all right. So um, next up is Michelle from Lehigh. Hi, I'm just sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? We can. Awesome. Okay. So before I do um, the demo, I just want to mention that um, what you're about to see is still in development. It's not officially tested or done. Um, um, also, before I do the demo, I want to just, I'm, I'm working on the NSIP module, also I should say. Um, before I do the demo, I just want to really briefly explain just a bit about NSIP. Um, and that it's a standard of messages exchange for resource sharing. And we use it here at Lehigh specifically for interlibrary loan. Um, so our interlibrary loan vendor requires us to have an NSIP responder. So their interlibrary loan software can communicate with our ILS and our current NSIP responder is built into Olay. Um, the other thing that I wanna mention briefly before the demo is a library, an open source library that I'm using within the Okapi NSIP module and that is the extensible catalogs and SIP toolkit. Um, the library is able to transform the incoming XML, which you see um, here, and um, transform this XML into objects and dynamically call the class. Um, there'll be one for each service that will communicate with the other or copy modules. Um, and then it's also able to take those objects and transform them back into response XML. So the NSIP is a um, exchange of um, XML messages. Um, let's see, for the demo, I'm going to send an NSIP message to my locally running copy. I'm using a Chrome extension um, to call the services. And so I've deployed within Okapi an edge module that I created that then forwards the request to the NSIP module. And I'm going to demonstrate the NSIP lookup user service, which calls um, mod users, mod circulation, and mod fees and fines, although it's not doing anything yet with the response from mod circulation or mod fees and fines. Um, and this is to look up information about the patron using their barcode. Uh, so if I, and this is um, 
very low tech uh, demo. If I click send, it um, has called <coughs> the NSIP service and here's what it returns, um, the XML. So you can see name, um, address, and a lot of this is driven by specific elements that are um, in the request. Um, you can see some user privilege information, like can they borrow um, their profile, so um, like student or staff member. Um, NSIP also has a concept of um, if there's a problem, it wants a specific NSIP problem response. So if I send in a um, barcode that doesn't exist, it returns a problem XML um, with details about the problem. Uh, that's it. Happy to answer any questions. This is cool, Michelle. It seems like you've been working pretty independently on this. I wonder if you've run into any challenges as you've tried to, to implement the NSIP. Um, yeah, there's definitely been a learning curve, and um, at some point, some feedback. At some point, I'd really like to have a. Is that oh, me? I, I don't know. Let me. I'm going to mute everyone except you. Um, the participants, and I mute you for a second. Uh, mute all. Okay, Michelle, okay. you should be able to talk. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's definitely been challenging. Um, at some point, I'd like to have a code review with someone um, just to you know walk through what I've done and to possibly spot any things that could be problematic. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Um, Probably Jakob could arrange something. Um, yeah. That would be a good place to start. Sure, of course. Yeah. But I think I'm at a good place now. I'm The lookup user um, service is going to use some rules. Um, so you can specify, like, if this patron has more than $150 in fines, then they can't borrow. You send back a blocked response. Um, so I have the rules um, working now. Um, so I, I feel like it's I've made good progress, and I think the use of the uh, toolkit makes it very extendable for the future. Great. Cool. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so let's see who's next. <clears throat> um, okay, so I don't think there are any more demos. Um, I just want to double check before I hand it over to Anton to talk about the quality dashboard. Was there, were there any other teams that wanted to demo something? All right, then Anton, it's all you with the quality updates. <laughs> and Michelle, I think you have to stop, yeah. stop sharing. Um, so we can take over. I'm trying to find a stop sharing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's always a challenge. Uh, maybe it have a at the top. Uh, oh, the at the top. top. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. We have about 63 participants on the call. Uh, kind of happy about wide audience when I can speak uh, about uh, quality and um, uh, uh, kind of share uh, the approach. Um, uh, one sec. Guys, you can hear me. You can mute me. Uh, okay. So let's um, uh, let me walk you through the um, quality dashboard. This uh, this page is being updated at the end of each sprint, and it has certain sections that are kind of designed to drive uh, qu overall quality of the product. So the first section is UI automated testing. 
which uh, we didn't have a lot and we just making progress, but just to show you the proof of it, uh, everyone, so this page and this uh, study code analysis tool is open to everybody. You just can go to sonarcloud.io uh, organization folio org and you can see code coverage on all the modules that we have. We made a good progress that we are tracking now 91 project uh, that kind of all the building blocks of the folio solution. So that being said, if you filter on UI projects, we have a little bit different picture compared to the back end. And you, uh, if I um, sort by, by coverage, you can see that we have a lot of modules that don't have coverage at all. And only uh, so eHoldings was module that was, um, um, be, uh, well, it was developed in parallel with tests, so it, they, it has a good code coverage. My profile is all same case. The UI check-in is our um, sample module that uh, will be used, um, uh, that can, can be used as a reference how to build UI tests. So. Um, but this is kind of the current picture with the uh, with our UI testing that we don't have a lot of code coverage. So as a result, you can expect a lot of bugs sifting through uh, during the integration stage. Uh, now let me switch to stripes. Um, so Stripes, this is uh, obviously base library for our UI where we, uh, we do have coverage and we keep growing it. So I'm reporting on this coverage in each sprint. For the Stripes components, we have 55%, Stripes core 40%. So uh, considering that our goal is to have at least 80, this is our acceptance criteria uh, or it's part of definition of done. For UI modules, we are still have work to do here as well. So, um, finally jumping back to the dashboard. So this is what the UI automated testing uh, section is. So for this, for this sprint, we finally got UI check-in into the reporting part and reporting percent. We grow the coverage for the Stripe score and here I highlight um, certain, uh, certain tasks that we're working on uh, to, uh, to improve uh, UI testing. So uh, we practically done with implementing big tests uh, for enabling big, uh, teams to write big tests, unit tests for UI. Uh, all the infrastructure work has been complete. It should be very easy to enable those tests. So the only thing is uh, remaining is documentation. And when documentation is done, then teams can follow documentation and start building UI, UI unit tests, which we're gonna track and celebrate the uh, coverage uh, that coverage has been achieved, you know, in the in the Sonar Cube. So the other big task that we are working on is uh, uh, enable packed consumer driven tests. So this is another kind of at this point research project that would the, with the goal to enable teams to enable interface tests between uh, UI and backend without need of deploying uh, de uh, deploying a backend. Uh, uh, all front end, so it should function uh, function uh, the same way as the unit test. Uh, one second, Let me close this. Uh, so that's that's what's going on with the UI automated testing. So performance tests. So. Um, by the way, uh, the way this page designed, you can just jump jump in and read the top section. And if you uh, don't want to go in de into details, that should be enough for you to get updates on what's going on. If you want more details, you can jump to 
um, to the ne ne next section down. So status, in, in terms of status, the unhappy phase, it's overall condition of the, of this area of testing. So you just saw that we don't have a lot of coverage on UI modules, therefore the phase is unhappy. And the trend is uh, positive because we are making progress and uh, uh, you know, that progress is listed here uh, in the notes, but we do make progress, therefore the trend is up, but overall status is still, uh, still kind of red. Same thing, uh, uh, applies to the performance testing. So we do have a, a performance test uh, job in uh, Jenkins. It's uh, in automation section uh, folio perf test. So there's something is broken here. So guys gonna take a look at that, but there are some, for example, if we go to this job, you can see performance report. Uh, and you can see for each API what performance is. So it's fairly straightforward test that is just testing individual a a a API, so it doesn't try to resemble the real system behavior. But um, that being said, we are, I think, a bit far from talking about real system behavior because as of right now, we have uh, 24 APIs that ever on average slower than 10 seconds. Last sprint we had 34 APIs that were slower than 10 seconds. And considering that our acceptance criteria that it should be two seconds, uh, we are way, way, way far from achieving that objective. So, but I'm just trying to take it in steps and right now just uh, taking results of a test and listing APIs in the, sorting them by average response time, slowest first here so that you guys can see what's going on and kind of react and uh, kind of pick what APIs you want, uh, you want to improve or see if your APIs are not, not performing. So basically the idea at this point is just to service, surface that we do have a serious performance problems and we have to jump on them now and make priority of this performance improvement now because if Chalmers uh, University is gonna try to go live sometime in February, uh, there will be no time to, uh, to fix the problem because usually if you have performance problem, it's most likely architectural problem. So um, my overall assessment that we need to have a serious look at this issue right now. And, um, and I know that we're short on resources and, uh, and, every, uh, and it's not easy, but this is just a serious issue because when somebody is gonna try to check out a book and it will take them two minutes, they just not gonna use the system. So that's what's going on with performance tests. Now, integration tests and CI CD pipeline, that's the section here on the, on the right. So in this section, um, I usually highlight uh, process improvements or any DevOps improvements that we're trying to do to improve, um, improve, uh, in, uh, improve when the code gets checked in, what kind of code gets checked in, when it's being tested, how soon can we get the feedback uh, from, the, from the change. So up until recently, we were just sweeping all the changes from the tip of the master of all the modules and put, putting them into the uh, folio snapshot and uh, ho hoping that that system will work. And well, as we all uh, know and find out that that approach is very stressful and uh, it's, it doesn't work well. So we need to change how things, uh, how things should be done. So 
in that respect, there are two themes. So one theme is we do need an envi sandbox environments for dev teams where they can collaborate with the product owners so that product owners don't have to wait until the change gets into the fullest um, snapshot stable because by, by that time it's too late to give feedback that something is wrong. It should be given before it gets uh, anywhere close to the master commit. So it's a challenging issue because it's hard to, well, um, lots of problems need to be resolved to enable uh, such a system. Uh, we have a lot of teams and uh, they're not supposed to step on each other. So it's a hard problem to solve, but we're kind of trying to figure it out right now. The second one is uh, the release process itself. So we are, so we did, uh, there was one great thing uh, that was done that we create, uh, created the um, Stripes framework so that to eliminate a lot of dependency problems when different developers were referring to different, uh, were referencing different versions of Stripes components. So now you have to reference just one Stripes framework so you're not gonna be referencing different Stripes, uh, uh, different versions of the same Stripes component. And continuing the theme and continue the thinking behind that we, we like to kind of change how the release being uh, being made and instead of uh, testing and integrating into the snapshot, we want to test against released versions. So we will have a build that integration uh, build that will have a list of known versions that has been released. Uh, not the latest one, but what was a team officially released. And if you, if you as a team ready to release ne next version of your component, you have to go through the steps and to, uh, to release your component. And only then it will go, uh, it will uh, go into the integration testing. And if integration testing fails, then your component will be rolled back. And uh, so this process kind of gives us an ability to roll back component because when we're integrating all the multiple check-ins from the snapshots, we can't roll back. We just have to solve it going forward by fixing the problem. But now we should be able to, if your component fails integration test, roll it back and um, try it again when, when the fixes are um, made. So it's gonna get, uh, snapshot system or we come up with a different name for that system, but integration tests are more stable and that system should be more stable. So all the tickets that you see here, most of them related to that, um, uh, related to that, to those efforts. And now to move to the escape defects, there is another link that you can click that shows overall what happens with uh, our defects across the projects. We are keep opening up the gap of unresolved defects. You can see it, see it here. So we are somewhere around um, 70, 70 unresolved defects um, for the past six months. Overall, we have 374 defects across all the projects and the interesting thing is that um, not all the projects have a, a high bug, bug count, but here's the top list that are top uh, bug producers. So um, technically if teams who are responsible for these projects will schedule hardening sprints where only bugs, uh, addressing bugs and not working on new functionality, then this can be uh, uh, kind of contained. But overall, our bug count is not terrible for the project, project size, but still, um, I think the hardening sprints, uh, and I don't mean hardening sprints at the end of the release cycle, but in the middle of release cycle would help to reduce the rot and uh, contain, uh, and reduce, reduce the bug count and keep, keep them low. The idea is that you should have 
as, um, as many bugs as you have members of your immediate family. So then you should be able to know them by name, but right, you know, when you have 47, you don't know them by name. That's kind of quite a bit. Um, so, so this is basically what this dashboard does. It just highlights certain areas of the product and the way it's designed, we can always add another section. So if anyone kind of think that we should add a section, then please get in touch with me. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, uh, to add more sections to the, uh, to the dashboard. Also, if you feel that you know another tool or another way to improve the process, uh, then please, uh, please reach out as well. My ultimate thinking that we need to build a system that allows developer to get the feedback on the change as soon as possible. And so this is why we need to kind of building, uh, build out uh, UI automation test because right now developers only getting feedback most mostly after change gets into the folio snapshot stable and by that time it's too late. So it could be weeks before product owner gives feedback to developer and we need to kind of compress that cycle down to hours uh, and that's what we're trying to do now. But by all means, if you have other ideas how to improve speed of feedback for the for any co um, you know code change that you're implementing, please let me know, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll do our best to integrate it into the process. So this looks great, Anton. This is um, a really great tool. It's also so, grown yeah. since I've seen it last. Um, <laughs> uh, questions. Um, Comments. Well, if for the sake of uh, everyone's lunch or dinner, we can, <laughs> we can um, uh, I can take uh, questions, uh, you know, on you know through the Slack or email. Yeah, 